My name is Kit Rollings. I live in Wellington and I joined the National Film Unit in March 1965 because it was at the time when television was thrusting its way into New Zealand lounges and I had met Johnny Hutchinson who was the then chief cameraman of the film unit and he had told me that uh, the sound department was um, uh, pointing trainee sound people and so I applied and got the job. It was a choice that was pretty easy to make because I'd, I loved music and was interested in sound. I had my own tape recorder and, and was very interested in recording. And the National Film Unit in those days had a very high reputation nationwide and I might add a, a deserved one. And so we were all familiar as kids with the, the film unit and so it was an easy choice to make really. It was a wonderful learning ground because we really had time to learn back then. The pace of life was so much slower. And in the early years, training was really on the job. You were shown how to operate the equipment and then sent out to use it. And I was very lucky right in the early stages to have a cameraman who had transferred from the sound department to the camera department, John Blick. And he helped, he was an inordinate help to me in setting up the sound equipment. I, I used to say that there was one of everything at the film unit. There were all walks of life, really, from the laboratory to the administration, the cameras, sound, and workshop, engineers, motor mechanics, storemen. So it was a very interesting collection of people, and we all got on well. So from that point of view, it was a, it was a fascinating place to work, really. When I started there, we had to record optical sound in the field and probably a lot of people these days don't understand what optical sound is, but it was the, the medium for replaying the audio on a film and it was on the edge of the film. So you would have the picture and the soundtrack was actually in 35 millimeter, it was 20 frames ahead. So where the picture cut was not where the sound cut. So it was always a bit of a mission. And the optical sound was very difficult to record on location. You were always nervous until the film was processed as to whether you got it dead right. Television really started using magnetic edge track on film. So it meant that you could record onto the film on a magnetic, and that was a much safer environment, much safer medium to record on. And so that was quite a step forward. And it wasn't until 1967 that the first Nagra tape recorder came about. And from then on, um, it was wonderful because you, you had a safe and reliable recording machine and you could record good quality sound on location. But then of course now it's 5.1 and technology goes on. The number of medium, the number of media I've seen come and go, starting an optical sound and coming right through to digital and you know you've had CDs, well they are a thing of the past and then we, then we had DAT tapes, digital audio tapes and Suddenly they were obsolescent and they've all gone. And now it's all on hard drives. So a huge difference. We certainly had to be creative. And there were a lot of things that when I started 
sound design or sound editing, I suddenly realised that he was a fascinating part of the medium to explore. You could match sound to picture. And the first film I ever did for the film unit on my own was called Only One Standard, and that was a film for the Meatworks. And they've been all been shot on location, but no sound recorded. <coughs> so I had to go out to Naronga Freezing Works with a long list of all the processes and record everything that happened and then come back to the studio, match it all up with the machines on screen and then mix it all together. And that was a fascinating project. I loved it. And then I was involved in a film called The Regular Soldier and that was all on the army. And so there were all manner of things to record there. Fantastic sounds. So magnetic was well established by the end of the 70s. We were then doing post-production on 35 millimetre magnetic machines, which was fairly new. In fact, the first one had been built by the film unit engineer, uh, who was a real specialist in that. And then we bought Westrex machines, and they were multi-track replay editing machines and so we were able to run three or four tracks at once which was fantastic. Well Dolby Stereo <coughs> had started overseas and we decided that we'd have to get involved in it. In, in its early days it was quite complex. It was a very, uh, very fine process um, required a lot of technology and uh, difficult to record for and really when Dolby first started it they had to authorize a facility so they they sent out a representative to set up our theater our main theater at Avalon to their standards and then to supervise the mix of the film. And a chap came out and he, he set it all up and Hugh had wanted to do the film Logarithms, which was a film about the, the logging of New Zealand timber, all processes from the forest to the finished product. And he said it'd be a wonderful It'd be a wonderful film to demonstrate Dolby Stereo. And so that was a bit nerve-wracking, but um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And so David Watt from Dolby Laboratories came out and set it up, set up the, the theatre. At that stage, we couldn't process the Dolby Stereo films and they had to go to Australia to be mastered and processed. And so David Watt had to return to England and I'd said to him, would you, uh, would you give me a critique of the film once we get a final print? I'll send you a print. And so I did. And uh, the next thing I knew was that the manager summoned me up to the office and said, I've just had a query from Rank Xerox who want to use Dolby uh, logarithms as an example of Dolby stereo transmission. He said, how do... They said they saw it at, at um, Dolby Laboratories. And I said, yes, well, I sent them a print so that they could give me an appraisal of it. And Dolby Laboratories used it for the next 10, 12 years, I think, for as a demonstration of Dolby Stereo. We were on location one day, and Kel and I were just nattering about nothing much, and, and uh, he said, well, what exactly is a decibel? And, and I said, what's an f-stop? And he said, well, you know, it's a logarithmic scale. I said, yes, so is a decibel. It's a logarithmic scale. It's, it's not, a, not a straight. Logarithms, said Hugh. 
And that was how the film got its name. A lot of us were involved in the planning of the studios out there. And to have brand new purpose-built facilities was absolutely astonishing. We just couldn't believe it. I think we were like dogs with two tails. It was fantastic. And I remember the day it, it opened in 1978, the then Prime Minister, Right Honourable Robert Muldoon, walked into the courtyard, the film unit at Avalon was built, in a sort of um, square. In the middle of the square was a, a courtyard with a swimming pool in it. Uh, it was actually a requirement for a water reservoir, but it was something I, I used to swim in. Muldoon apparently looked all around and he said, how did they get this through? <laughs> mm. <laughs> so from there on, the days of the film were numbered. I think it's vital that we keep our, our the, the negatives, the masters of all the films that ever went through that film unit. The early weekly reviews were fascinating stuff. And a lot of people might say they were propaganda. Well, that's what everybody was doing at the time and that's what, that's what life was about. But I remember at Avalon we had uh, we sort of made a last ditch stand, I suppose you might say, and I proposed at one stage that, that we should have a weekly slot on television and run every old weekly review. So there was a, quite a, an archive of all these reviews and then pictorial parades, and in the meantime we could go on to making other things and build up a real good, really good collection of New Zealand history and, and times, the passing of times. Because if you look back over the years, I mean, the past is a blueprint for the future and, and there's so much we can learn from looking at those things and seeing, well, that's how things were done back then. And I think it's vital that the, that archive be restored, renovated and, and kept for future generations.